Hello, this is Dr. Churchill, and we're returning for Astronomy 308 into the Final Frontier. We are in Module 2, which is um, somewhat known as the space race, though we've passed through the space race, as you all know, and um, we've even talked then about the shuttles. Uh, we talked about uh, Skylab and the Russian period of all of the um, space stations and that happened. And then we've also uh, come all the way up to talking about uh, modern day Roscosmos and then the uh, modern day Chinese space program. And so I'd like to bring us up to date on what the other nations are doing besides the big three, which would you know, be the Americans, NASA, the Russians, Roscosmos, and the Chinese and the CNSA. And I would like to talk about um, the fact that there are a lot of other countries that are really making a lot of progress and that the space industry is really a, you know, $80 billion plus industry around the world. And it, there are a lot of plans to push it and double it very rapidly in the next decade. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my slides with you. Here we are, and I'm just going to increase my size here a tad. There we go. Okay, so welcome aboard to uh, lecture 2.5b, Other National Space Programs. And this is going to be quite the brief overview, um, though, it may not seem brief, it truly is just a cream scraping of what's going on. And honestly, uh, there's too much knowledge for a single individual like myself, who's not an expert on this, to uh, really do a deep dive into each country. But I have done a shallow dive into each country, and I hope you will enjoy those things that we are going to learn or talk about today. So my first slide here, I am bringing up a couple of points. The first comes right from the pictures, you know, people that are not American going into space or Russian going into space or Chinese that are going into space, but other people from other countries. And um, so the first one I have here is um, I have the United Arab Emirates being shown on the left, including here uh, their first astronaut who flew on, flew on the Russian Soyuz up to the space station. And then the fact that they have a very active satellite program and um, even have sent a probe to Mars. So we're gonna talk about that. And that already that might surprise you, the, the things you're gonna learn here today. And on the right here, we have some Japanese um, astronauts from JAXA, the, the Japanese Space Administration. Um, and they have a very active astronaut program as well, though they don't have their own spacecraft to fly into space. They uh, are big on launch vehicles and we'll, we'll show that they actually are in the launch vehicle business quite a bit and um, that their astronauts have flown uh, on the space shuttle and to the, uh, I think to the International Space Station. I might be wrong on that last one. So here are uh, basically a dozen um, countries and their space programs. And uh, I guess one thing I want to say here, uh, even though I mentioned China, we're not going to talk about China today, um, but we are going to talk about ESA, which is the European Space Agency. And it turns out that though the European countries each have their own space program, they all contribute a certain fraction of their funding for space into the European Union's you know, equivalent of a national space program. And uh, this is called the ESA or the European Space Agency. And it's quite large um, and quite comprehensive. So here we go. The first thing I wanna do is just show you a slide of how much money is being spent in these areas, uh, sort of the, the world government expenditures towards space. And what I want you to realize about this slide is that to the best of my knowledge, these numbers are the total amount of money going into all space activities, not just necessarily space operations and uh, exploration programs like uh, crewed missions. 
So the other thing I wanna point out on this diagram here is this United States obviously is dominating in terms of money. Um, and it turns out that this circle should be about 10 times larger than the Russian circle. So it tells you that they've really shrunk this circle down, but the rest of the circles are in fairly good proportionality. So we can see here um, what Russia is doing, what China is doing, what the United States is doing. Those were the big three. But you can see that there is some healthy funding going around and very much like our map that is a, a leftover from the sea race and the period of colonization and imperialism that we talked about that set up the modern world, you can see that there's a large amount of funding uh, centered in the European area. So here we have the Americas in the dark purple, and then the European and uh, uh, Netherlands, not Netherlands, sorry, um, Norway, Switzerland, and Finland. Um, and then um, we have down here uh, this, the Asian market. And so you can see here that Asia is really in the process of building up. China has really been growing rapidly. Japan has been also growing. And and India, it turns out. So we'll be talking about Japan, India, and we'll be talking a little bit about South Korea. They're really the, the, the forces that are playing in this area of the world. Notice that Africa is really, again, only nascent. It, uh, Africa is really, its century is coming, but it really has been suppressed and held back due to this period of imperialism and colonization. And then uh, Europe, of course, has the, the big countries that we all know about, France and Germany and Italy. And then here's the entire European Union, which is on the order of Germany's uh, of funding. And then we have France here and the United Kingdom are, are the big players. But today we'll not only talk about those, but we're gonna mention Italy a bit as uh, another player. And then South America, again, also uh, suffering from the period of imperialization and colonization uh, and just working its way up. Again, its century will probably come. And I'm not sure who's gonna emerge first, Africa or South America, that's beyond my pay grade, but you can see here that these programs are also quite small. Now, if you wanna turn that funding into what are they doing in terms of space operations and, and exploration, this is another uh, budget. Um, bar graph. And so here we have uh, on top clearly NASA with 22 and some change in the billions, uh, the CNSA of China around basically on the order of half of that um, at 11 billion, ESA, the European Space Agency up here at about 7.43 billion. And then you have Japan at 3 billion, France at about 3 billion, Russia at two and a half, Germany, the DLR at 215, and then India down here at just under 2 billion a year that they spend, and then Italy at just under two, and then we're gonna briefly talk about South Korea, which is breaking into the space uh, industry. Okay, so let's start with Canada. Um, I guess at some level, we're gonna go from low budgets to high budgets. So this is our neighbor, Canada, um, it's Canadian, or the Canada Space Agency. It was established around 1989, and uh, their current budget in 2020 is around $315 million. Now, Canada has had an extensive astronaut uh, history with the United States. And so here is a list over on the side here of the Canadian astronauts that have flown with NASA. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying pointing out who is the first from a various country to, to fly in space, okay? And that was Mark Gamow, uh, flew with STS-41 in 1984, the, near the beginning of the shuttle program. And the first female that flew for Canada was Roberta Bonder, who flew in 1992. And you can see there's a huge gap here of almost 10 years, and a lot of that was due to the Challenger accident in 1986. Um, there's been a few of them that have uh, gone to this International Space Station. A few of them have flown, say, uh, Robert Thursk has flown on the Soyuz. Um, 
I think one of their most famous astronauts is this gentleman by the name of Chris Hadfield, and you might see him on YouTube, but he's, um, he's flown several times. He flew up here on, on SCS-74 in 95, and he's actually flown to Mir, Mir, and he's flown to the International Space Station and been on some of those crews. So he's probably their most uh, experienced astronaut. Now, what Canada is known for, um, in addition to having this astronaut corps that has uh, flown and contributed and collaborated with the United States, um, part of their, their uh, collaboration is that they have been very good at building robotic arms. And there's robotic arms attached to the shuttle or where, and then there's robotic arms attached to the International Space Station. And so, um, these particular arms are really good for reaching out. Uh, they're very slow, they're very precise, they're controlled uh, by the astronaut to uh, basically latch onto a satellite and then uh, control its inertia and then slowly bring it in and hold it steady so that it can actually be worked on. Uh, other things is that sometimes the astronauts themselves will stand on the end of the arm and they'll be brought to um, a satellite or move to a module wh where they can work on the International Space Station. Um, the thing about um, Canada that some of the people that uh, are involved in the space program in Canada is that they don't have any lift vehicles that they've built themselves. So for example, they really can't launch their own satellite into low Earth orbit, which I'm going to call LEO, OK? So um, they do have a lot of sounding rockets. I'm, I'm showing here in the upper right this thing called the Brant, or the Black Brant uh, 12. Uh, they do a lot of atmospheric sounding rockets. So they've, they've been building rockets for years, but they never built anything that are heavy lift, um, OK? And they are in the process of building a launch facility uh, is supposed to become operational in 2022. One of the things you'll see in this lecture is that many of the things we talk about just seem to be planned for right around the corner. And I've been watching these plans come and go and come and go for several decades now, and nothing seems to happen. But I really think that we are on the verge of, of these plans really being carried out because so many countries are really on the verge of really making breakthroughs. Um, so anyway, this is um, going to be called the Maritime Launch Services um, is going to be actually running this space for and uh, the rockets that they have decided to contract with our Ukrainian Cyclone M44 rockets, uh, which is really a good workhorse rocket put out by the Ukraine uh, Space Agency, which we won't be talking about today. I guess what, you're, what you'll, you'll see, you'll piece together here is that there's different niches to make money and some people have made their money by building heavy lift vehicles and then basically sell, selling you know, spots on the payloads. Uh, to get people up to orbit. So I have this little news article here uh, that was from the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation. And it was a, an interview in which people were talking about that in Canada, we're really falling behind. We need to get our act together. And so here's a couple quotes, you know, we are falling behind, there's no doubt about it. And the Canadian space policy framework is so stuck in the past that they're not willing to take risks. So it, it does appear that there's frustration in Canada, and it's not clear exactly how rapid they're, they're going to grow and what direction they're going to grow. The next country I'd like to talk about is Israel. Now, Israel, I think, has summed themselves up uh, by being small country, big dreams. They were established in 1958, which is about the same time as NASA, the same year as NASA, and their annual budget is on the order of about $14.5 million. Okay. Now, um, one of the things that is um, really awesome about Israel is number one, um, they have made a commitment to building lift vehicles, and they have made a commitment toward lunar exploration. And so let me talk about the lift vehicles first. 
so that is over here. It's called the Shabbat. Um, at least that's how I know how to pronounce it. And I may have that wrong. Um, but basically, um, this vehicle uh, became operational in around 1983. And it's uh, solid rocket boosters. And we all know that from the space shuttle, what that's all about. And um, it's, it's quite a good workhorse. And with that, they've launched several of their own satellites. Okay. Now, when they launched, they, uh, you know, as you know, they're, they're, they're under Turkey and over by Jordan um, and on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. So they have to launch out over the Mediterranean Sea from their spaceport. Okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, Israel is doing is uh, lunar science and exploration. They're, they're very focused on this, okay? So uh, this is a program that was established by them, and it's part of an international effort, actually, um, to get out into the moon and get out into the solar system. Of that, there's a subgroup called Space IL, okay? It's a, it's a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team of a lot of scientists and you know space uh, rocket scientists. And this group came together uh, as a subset and said, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna win the Google Lunar X Prize. Now, if you don't know what the Google Lunar X Prize is, you have to launch your own, uh, with your own launch vehicle, you have to then navigate to the moon and go into orbit and land on the moon and then send a video back to earth. And if you do that, it's around a $30 million uh, prize. And what their plan was to do was to uh, donate that to charity. But they really wanted to win this prize. And they came literally within a second or a second and a half of winning this prize. Um, they built a uh, spacecraft that they called Barashi. I, again, I think that's how you pronounce it. I could be making bad pronunciations. It translates in Hebrew to in the beginning, which of course is the, the opening words of the books of Moses of Genesis. Um, so it's a robotic soft lander and it was meant to soft land on the moon on the near side and it made it to the moon. And uh, basically it lost navigation right at the last seconds and crashed into the moon and is destroyed. And one of the, well, there's two great photographs from Bereshit. One is that it uh, looked backward and took a selfie of itself uh, with the earth in the background. That's this picture right here. Again, you can see small country, big dreams, space IL. And then uh, the next thing it did as it came down toward the moon, it uh, took a selfie of itself approaching the moon. So no doubts that Bereshit was uh, in cislunar space and on its way to the moon. Um, but it unfortunately didn't make it and they didn't win the $30 million, but they want to turn this around. And two days after uh, the accident, they came out and announced Bereshit 2, we're putting it together, we're going to land on the moon in 2024. So keep an eye out for that. That's really cool, big news. And it was um, very exciting the day, uh, April 11th. I remember watching it uh, live and unfortunately, it ended in tragedy. So I just want to briefly mention the Korean Aerospace Research Inter Institute. Research Institute. Um, it was established in 1989 and has some 700 employees. And um, what I wanted to do is talk about the fact that this is a, a really growing um, space agency. And I, I went to their website and I was able to determine that they, they, they really have a series of what they call strategic goals in multiple different subcategories. I just grabbed a few of those to look at here. Um, strategic goal number one in uh, this category of uh, human space um, is developing the, the transport technology that leads to common space access. So, you know, we're talking about launch facilities, launch vehicles. And then we're talking about, and number two was promoting a spaceport that will realize the popularization of space travel. So they apparently want to build a spaceport and make that a place where other people or themselves can launch. Very similar to what New Mexico has done with Spaceport America and other companies are now coming in 
and launching or will be launching from Spaceport America in 2021. I'm pretty darn sure we're going to finally get there. Um, they have some really long reaching goals, but those goals really reach into the 2030s, but they want to secure Korea's activity on the moon. Now, I think that's interesting wording. You know, we want to secure our activity on the moon. And that's sort of interesting because it sort of has that nationalistic uh, pie carving out uh, imperialistic uh, language uh, embedded in it. And we all know we don't know what's going to happen out in the solar system in the next hundred years, but uh, I have a feeling that humanity hasn't really evolved much um, to the era of wisdom yet, um, and we will continue to take our culture out into space. And goal seven, realizing the feasibility of space exploration and securing future strategic resources, there it is again, for utilizing space resources. So again, they're worried about being a strong country and having a, a presence in this new ocean that needs to be sailed on, okay? Um, so it basically in 2016, um, the Korean Aerospace Research Institute reached out and signed a pact with NASA. And so they have been collaborating with NASA and they want to basically try to work that lunar program in a couple of phases. And the bottom line is um, after they get through phase one, uh, they want to be uh, get a lunar orbiter and lander and rover and do this by 2030. So, and they want to do that on their own launch vehicle. So they really have a tall order uh, to work on over the next, you know, nine years, nine and a half, eight and a half years. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I just grabbed these from the website too, and I just wanted to show them. I didn't necessarily want to go through them and talk about the fact that they are involved in a lot of aeroflight is where, you know, as well. And then uh, some satellites that they've been working on uh, in collaboration with um, various uh, other space agencies and that these have gone all the way back to 2010 that, that this kind of uh, activities have been going on. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the UK, uh, Britain and um, Talk about the United Kingdom's space agency. This was established in around 2010. Um, and that has to do with the fact that there were a lot of small little agencies and they decided to nationalize them all into one United Kingdom space agency. Uh, there's about 600 people that work for this company. When I've had the chance to find out how many employees are working under the, in these agencies, I try to put that down. Some, sometimes I couldn't find that information. They have a budget of around 900 million annual, and um, they give about 10% of that to the European Space Agency. So they contribute 10% of um, European Space Agency. I'm sorry, not 10% of theirs, 10% of the Euro European Space Agency. Interestingly, we all know that uh, the UK went through Brexit politically um, and economically but not in, in the word of, of space. They did, not, they did not go through Brexit with space. So they're still a member of the ESA, European Space Agency. Uh, they do have somewhat of a long history because right after World War II, you know, they had some of Von Braun's rockets too, and they started getting into the launch business and trying to understand uh, ballistic missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, so, Literally from the 50s to about 85, they built rockets, they worked on launch facilities, and they began launching satellites and whatnot. Okay. And so their first satellite was something called the Aerial One, and it launched in 1962, which is right around Project Mercury time, if you remember. And this is a picture of the rocket here as a, a United States Delta IX rocket, and then it launched the Aerial One in 1962. Uh, from 85 to 2010, um, they were known as a sort of the, they sort of had this overall put together hodgepodge national space program, if you will, um, so that they had uh, the Outer Space Act of 1986, 
and that that allowed them to codify legally how people could enter space through the United Kingdom um, conduit, and so that was ratified in 1989, and now they they've set up sort of a, a national legal structure for launching, and then. Um, they became contributors of the International Space Stations, and uh, they've been involved with launching several satellites during this time as well. But it was in 2010 that um, they really came together um, and the formation of the UKSA, if you will, um, uh, was codified into law. And at that point in time, there was also a push for a budget increase. So uh, the UK really kind of stepped up their seriousness about space in 2010. And one of the main things that they decided to work on was something called Skylon, which is basically a single stage to orbit uh, space plane. And I've shown some pictures of it here, or an artist's conception of it here. And you can see it's very futuristic looking, has a small payload here. And I believe it is designed to be completely automated. Um, you can see here uh, what it looks like from the front and, um, or the rear, excuse me. And then here's the side elevations. And then here is seeing it from the top. This is five meters right here, which is about, I think uh, 15 feet. So that can give you an idea of how large and how long this thing is, okay. Um, Okay, so then uh, I guess the last thing I wanted to talk about um, is that the British astronauts uh, have also uh, are part of the ESA, the European Space Agency's Astronaut Corps, and uh, they've either flown directly through ESA, or I'm just going to call it ESA because that's what it's called, or, or through NASA. And so here's one of their astronauts on the uh, space station uh, who's actually recording a message for Queen Elizabeth too. Okay, now one of the things that they've also decided to do is they've been wanting to build spaceports. So it turns out that there's plans for about six different spaceports on this small island uh, of the UK or islands of the UK. And so this came out in the Space Act of, uh, Space Industry Act of 2018. And so um, I'm not gonna show the pictures, but you can easily look up the idea that there's these uh, various locations that they're building these spaceports and some of them are supposed to be done quite soon. Okay, so briefly let's talk about Italy, Agenzia Spaziale Italiana, and that's the last time I'm gonna try and say that. Uh, this is called the ASI, and it was established in 1988 and currently has around 200 employees and a budget of about $2.1 billion. They uh, contribute about 13% of ESA's budget. Excuse me. Now, one of the things that I like to do is, is talk about some of the major people that uh, were drivers of what happened in their countries. And uh, in this case, Luigi Broglio uh, was the Italian rocket scientist, aerospace engineer, uh, who really pushed forward the uh, Italian space program. So um, he's known as the Italian von Braun uh, to his people. Um, now, it turns out that um, the Italians had sent up their first satellite called the San Marco in 1964. And here's a picture of it in, in the lab back in those days. Um, and then as far as human space flight goes, they definitely have had several astronauts fly into space or uh, the, the uh, STS, the space uh, transport system, or basically the space shuttle, and also up to the International Space Station. So it's kind of nice that Italy, through the ESA, ESA, has uh, gotten engaged with a lot of space flight. I'm sure they're all very proud. And of course, Franco Malerba was the first of these astronauts back in 1992. Um, they are known for a few things. Again, we're just doing surface integration of what, what these countries have been doing. Uh, the first satellite they put up was uh, Beppo Sachs, and they did this in collaboration with the Netherlands in 1996. And this actually, as an astronomer, I know this satellite very, very well. It was very famous for its uh, ability to observe the universe in x-rays and collect some great scientific data and advance our knowledge uh, of the universe. 
They also developed a high energy astronomical satellite called AGAR, which was a gamma ray observatory. Okay, and so X-rays and gamma rays are part of the electromagnetic spectrum that are the highest energy. And so these kinds of satellites would be picking up things like black holes, um, exploding stars, things that are very high energetic uh, objects. And so, many of them transient objects, sort of like a major explosion or a major uh, energy output event from a black hole. Okay. Now, interestingly, um, and we'll talk about this, they launched this on the Indian Space Research Organization's ISRO's uh, launch vehicle back in 2007. They've been a big player in the, the launcher development of ESA, and ESA's main um, lift vehicle, heavy lift vehicle, uh, they had an Arian series, but the, the one that is the workhorse of ESA is the Ariane 5, and it launches from a French spaceport. And uh, there's two areas, one in France and, and then one in, in Guana, in South America. Um, um, then uh, it turns out that the, there's another smaller launcher uh, called the Vega, and I'm, I'm showing a picture of it here, that could put about 1,500 kilograms in the low Earth orbit, but they're also very much involved in. Um, kind of makes sense since the person that started their space agency was sort of a rocket scientist, you know, the, the Italian von Braun. They've been involved in uh, development of modules, space modules that have ended up on the uh, International Space Station. Um, there are three of them that they built that dock, uh, Tranquility, Harmony, and Coppola. And uh, this is a picture here of Harmony. Uh, on the Canadian arm that you can see barely right through there. And then um, they, this, uh, they've had three cargo carriers which um, are brought up and then, and then uh, are transferred as, as uh, little payloads and dock actually with the uh, International Space Station. And those are Leonardo, Raffaello and uh, Donatello. And uh, this is a picture here of Raffaello. One last thing that they're known for is the TSS. That is a tethered satellite and system. And uh, there's two of them that they built. There are two astronauts uh, in two different missions, went up and tested TSS-1, and then later tested TSS-2. And this is the idea of tethering a satellite behind, say, the space shuttle, and then helping it gather momentum so that you can actually change it into a different orbit and, and actually put it into a desired target orbit. Um, some of these tests were actually fairly successful, but they also found out that the materials of the tether, um, they need to work on that a little bit. Okay, so here we go with the Indian Space Research Organization. And I have included two videos with this module on our class canvas page that discuss ISRO in some detail. And it's really, um, I, I, don't, I can't praise it enough. India has really stepped in, they've stepped in large and they are, have momentum that is tremendous. And so I really think that uh, the, the other country that is going to sort of be in the categories of say China, Russia and ESA and the NASA is going to be ISRO. And, and you should really keep an eye out for what the Indians are doing and what they have achieved already. Okay. Um, so here are their, uh, their launch vehicles that they have. And it turns out that they have evolved these over time. And it's this GSL-5 Mark III, which is a real workhorse and very powerful heavy lift uh, vehicle. It can actually you know, uh, lift uh, heavy payloads to the moon. Um, as far as the space centers around India, they're, they're popping up all over the place like popcorn. And uh, I just wanted to show this to you because I wanted you to see that they're very serious about space and they're building the infrastructure all throughout their country. Here is the, the uh, Mark III GSL-5 rocket. And um, you can see that this is a very well-established rocket and 
um, it has a great track record for launches, very few failures, very small failure rate. Um, okay, so let's go down this list on the left. Crewed spacecraft, space station, lunar exploration, and Mars exploration. You know, that basically says it all. They've got a plan, okay? Um, their crewed spacecraft plan. I, I used to always say manned. Now I always say crewed. And there's something weird about that word. So please forgive me if it sounds like I'm saying something's crude when I'm saying it's actually a crewed spacecraft for what it's worth. Um, so they're building a three person crewed spacecraft that will be capable of docking and capable of rendezvous. So we're talking about something a little bit less sophisticated or as sophisticated as an Apollo spacecraft. Um, I meant to say like a Gemini spacecraft at a minimum because it can change orbits, it can rendezvous and, and then it can dock. But for it to be three people, it would have to be at least, you know, the size of some kind of uh, Apollo spacecraft. And, but as we talked about when we had Andrew Chaikin speak with us, the, everything is going to be modernized compared to the Apollo spacecraft. So I, I really should say it's going to be better than the Apollo spacecraft. Um, their first goal is just to have a seven-day mission in low Earth orbit. And uh, their plans are to land, launch it on their own vehicle, the Mark III, and do this in 2022. Now, I think you should expect in all seriousness that this will happen in 2022 or 2023, unless there's some catastrophic event that happens in the program. But the fact of the matter is they're on a roll and they have the momentum. And so I would watch the newsreels for that as well. India did not join the International Space Station. They plan to build their own space station. So this is another country that really wants to be independent in space and do everything on its own. They're not gonna depend on any infrastructure from any other country, okay? And we'll find that some of the other countries have bold plans, but their infrastructure depends upon NASA or depends upon Roscosmos. Okay, so that's one thing that's, you know, you have to salute uh, ISRO for. Um, now let's talk about uh, the lunar explanation. Um, the Chandrayaan-1, I have problem pronouncing a lot of words. The Chandrayaan-1 mooncraft, uh, it actually has was launched and uh, it orbited the moon in November of 2008. So I'm not sure you are aware that over 10 years ago, uh, India had lifted their own spacecraft with their own launch vehicle from their own country and, and put that in orbit around the moon. Um, this spacecraft caused a hell of a stir because it actually discovered uh, permafrost water on the surface of the moon in the South Pole. And so several other spacecraft were designed in response to that discovery to go and probe this um, water. And in fact, one of the things that, that the Indians planned to do was to put a probe down in there. And NASA, of course, now has this plan. China has this plan. So this area where the water on the moon is, is, is really a big deal. So uh, tip of the hat to the Indians for, the, for that con scientific contribution. Um, there was an orbital lander named Vikram and a rover named Pragyan. And well, it just turned out that they, very similar to what happened with Israel, this was coming down for the landing and in the very last seconds, they experienced a software glitch and it crashed into the moon. So unfortunately, they were not uh, able to make a soft landing on the moon, but we have two countries, Israel and India, that were within literally seconds of accomplishing that goal. How about Mars exploration? Okay, so they have this thing called the Mars Orbiter Mission, or MOM, and uh, this was launched in November of 2013. It entered Mars orbit in September of 2014. Again, were you aware India had done this, you know, eight, 10 years ago? Uh, they were the first country to enter Mars orbit on their absolute very first attempt. So that, that was an amazing uh, accomplishment. Here is the, um, the moon lander and the, and the, and the moon rover. Uh, Vikram is this lander here and then the rover uh, Pragyon. And uh, 
There it is in the lab, and it is unfortunately in pieces on the moon now. So I'm not going to go through this timeline, but it's just to show you that from 1969, there's been a progression that has developed, okay, and then uh, building of their rockets, building of the uh, satellites, building of the spacecraft, and then putting these things in orbit. Um, here's Chandrayaan-1, launched in 2008. Here's MOM, has entered the Martian orbit. And then I added this up here that Chandrayaan-2 launched uh, in July of 15 of 2019. And uh, we have yet to see uh, what's going on with that. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to edit that out. And, and, and I added here, and I added here that in July 15th, 2019, the Chandrayaan-2 launched the mission we just discussed where the lander had crashed on the moon. Uh, for, for fun, I wanted to show you this, uh, as an aside, this future missions to the moon infographic, uh, starting with 2019. And here we have India down at the bottom. Um, I don't know why, they don't have India up here. So I put, where is India? Because I think they're going to make another attempt. And um, so we've got the USA Moon Express, NASA coming down here with these various robotic probes. A lot of this is to look for uh, the water and study the water on the moon. Uh, South Korea is trying to make an attempt to land in late 2020, um, I believe. And then uh, uh, Roscosmos, Russia, uh, Japan, and then the, the finally a crewed mission uh, to the moon uh, for NASA. And uh, this would be Project Artemis, which we will discuss in, in module three of the course. Uh, and the idea is to put the first woman on the moon. And so this might happen in early 2022. So that's only a year away from now, which I think is probably um, a tall order. Again, Russia, Japan, United States. Interestingly, you don't see anything more about China um, rather than the, the um, Chang'e 4 and Chang'e 5s that we talked about previously. But I believe that China is going to be back to the moon too. And I believe that we have a real run for our money uh, for China to put a crude uh, mission on the moon. And you can see USA here, USA through SpaceX here and then uh, USA again, and then finally the Russians. But I believe the Chinese plan on something in the 2023-2024 era, and uh, should keep an eye out for that as well. Okay, moving right along here is the German Aerospace Center, and um, they were established about 1997. They have roughly a little over 8,000 employees, uh, 2.1 Five billion dollars and 10% uh, of ESA's budget. Uh, this was a consolidation of about seven space, aerospace, and research institutes, and it had that uh, started their operations around 1969, and then were all consolidated in 1997. Uh, we have, in this case, some German astronauts, many of whom have flown. In fact, all of these here have flown, and uh, then there is the uh, I'm showing here the operations center just to show you that there's quite an investment in the infrastructure on the ground for the space operations. And uh, they developed something called the Columbus module that is a module on the International Space Station in which there's a lot of scientific instruments that are operated by the astronauts. Um, basically, you can put them into three major categories, uh, research and aeronautics that is uh, study the earth, um, including satellites that uh, do remote sensing of the planet in order to basically uh, provide us information about the evolution of uh, the weather and uh, basically the energy budget of the planet. And then planetary research, uh, their contribution there has been more to build cameras and build infrastructure. So they built a high resolution camera for the Mars Express mission. Uh, they uh, are operating the control center for something called the Rosetta Orbiter, which is looking at a particular comet um, that did a comet flyby and um, then provided cameras for, say, 
uh, the spacecraft called Dawn for high resolution photos of the planets of Vesta and Ceres. So these are, uh, a, this is a spacecraft that, that flew to these, these small bodies and made close up photographs of it. So they've been involved in a lot of space research, as you can see, and, and, and I mentioned already their human space flight that uh, about 10 Germans have actually flown and are part of ESA's astronauts corps, flown on the shuttle, um, mostly with the space labs. And so the other thing that, that they've done in terms of human space flight is build what's called the Deutschland 1 and the Deutschland 2. And these are two uh, modules that go into the bay of the space shuttle and they're literally laboratories that are in there. And um, they flown, they built both of these, they've flown both of these, and of course sent up their astronauts as mission specialists on the space shuttle, shuttle when they flew these. Excuse me. Okay, let's talk about Japan for a minute. Uh, the Japan Aerospace Exploratory or Exploration Agency. Um, JAXA, established in 2003, about 20 years ago. It's about 1,500 employees and has an annual budget of, of about uh, 3 billion, of which about 1.7 is going into space exploration. Um, so it turns out that they had these three major institutes, uh, Space and Aeronautical Sciences, National Aerospace Laboratory, and then the National Space Development Agency. They were all merged together in 2003 to form JAXA. Much of their work has gone into uh, building heavy lift rockets and heavier and heavier and heavier lift rockets and trying to get the cost of uh, or uh, per kilogram to orbit uh, costs down. And then they built the infrastructure of a spaceport. They call it the Kanagashima Space Center. And this is in the very southern island of Japan here. You can see the, the pin showing you where it is. It reminds me a lot of Prince Henry's Sagres, which was in that southern peninsula of Portugal. Now we have the southern peninsula of Japan, and it's a very flat area um, and really well suited for sending rockets to space. And so a lot of people, they hire the uh, launch facilities and the, the launch vehicle of uh, JAXA in order to send their satellites to space. Um, here is an evolution of their, their rockets. So this is the, the H2. And uh, this has been a workhorse rocket for a long time. And now they've, they've developed this H3 series. And then here's their heaviest lift one, the H324L. Here's a picture of the H324L on the pad at their space center. And then our first astronaut into space who is Japanese is Toy Toyohiro Akakiyama. Uh, Akayama. I really suck at pronunciations. And um, he was a civilian, which is an interesting story, which I won't go into for, for time, but um, he flew aboard the Soyuz rocket in 1990. And then here is, um, in 1970, the Japanese first satellite that they launched launched on one of their L4S rockets, which is a very small rocket, or it looks small in this picture near the building, but it was quite powerful and it was able to get this very small, light, low mass satellite into space. Now, they've been very busy uh, with their astronaut corps and flying uh, with the United States in, in the shuttle missions. And so um, you can see here, other uh, retired astronauts that flew in the 1980s. Um, and here's uh, the first woman to fly in space. Here's a picture of her here. And um, I always like to point that out because I love to see this, the country is not discriminating against women as much as possible. I know it still exists in a huge way. And um, I have some random photos here of some of the, the, the new astronauts that uh, are still active. And um, then I just wanted to discuss the fact that all of these astronauts have flown in space as well um, between 1992 and 2009. And several of them have had to move um, on to flying on the Soyuz rockets in preparation for uh, the fact that the shuttle uh, fleet was going to retire. So 
this is one of the um, space agencies that has a lot of vision about the future that I, I just wanted to show you like so an infographic of this, uh, not necessarily go through it all, but the point is that you can see that they have plans for the moon, uh, including you know some landers and some rovers and um, some actually putting up some kind of permanent resupply fuel uh, reserves uh, for the a lunar landing, which they've talked they have say is approximate in 2030. Now um, they also are planning to uh, go to Mars uh, and do a Mars landing mission as well. But what you'll notice is that they really depend on the infrastructure of NASA and their lift vehicles and their what's called a gateway. Okay, and so. One of the things that NASA is planning is to put an orbiter around the moon that they're calling a gateway. And I suppose you can think of it sort of as another um, space station, but someplace for people to dock around the moon and then go down to the moon and then they can come back up and dock. Then they can leave and come back to the earth. And so this is what they're calling a gateway. And uh, they're also planning on using the Orion spacecraft and also the Space Launch System, or SLS, rocket of NASA's. Now, um, we're going to talk about this a little later in the lecture. This SLS uh, rocket system um, is really super expensive and literally has already be, been made obsolete or will be made obsolete within the next few years. And it's unfortunate because it's been in development for 15, 20 years and um, has cost the United States a tremendous amount of money. It's really been um, a money pit. But I shan't spend too much time giving you my opinions about things, but I don't think the SLS will be flying in 10 years, okay? So um, what I wanted to point out here was that there's a lot of danger for Japan, I think, to depend on other countries to accomplish their goals. And, um, that's just something that I think India is being very smart about. Okay, the United Arab Emirates, an, another space program that people don't really think about too much, but one that is really nascent and really is pushing forward. So there is a, there's a, a lot of infrastructure being built rapidly in this way. Um, one of the things you may not realize is that the UAE Space Agency has actually built an orbiter, they call it Mars Hope, they launched it on a JAXA H2 rocket, so they hired the Japanese to launch their vehicle for them, and uh, this is successfully in orbit around Mars. And again, I'm not sure everybody's aware that the United Arab Emirates has uh, accomplished these great space feats. So they call this the Emirates Mars mission, and um, it successfully launched in July of 2020. And, you know, it's history now in February 2021, which is what, a month ago from when I'm giving this lecture, it successfully went into orbit around Mars. And this, this satellite is really designed to measure uh, atmospheric and climate types of changes in Mars. And it's, um, it's heralded as being a satellite that can really provide insights in Mars in a niche that nobody else is observing Mars in. Um, not developed yet, but definitely in plan. It was announced in September of 2020 that the um, United Arab Emirates is planning on a lunar mission. And um, they're going to call this rover that they're going to soft land, uh, Rashid, and that's going to be named after Sheikh Mohammed, who's the, the leader of Dubai uh, government area. Um, got the government of Dubai um, is named after his father, and his father was the person who really, in a sense, um, was the person who had put the impetus behind building the space program and building up uh, the Dubai area of the, the UAE. Um, so anyway, he, it, it doesn't seem to have a very, very uh, well-defined plan that I could pick up, at least from my uh, quick, small, shallow dives into each of these countries. Um, and so 
the quote was that it will cover areas not reached in previous exploration missions. So they, they clearly plan to find some niche on the moon to uh, make their own. Kind of an interesting thing if, if every country starts picking little areas around the moon, I think you should you know, get out your little pin board and start putting up these pins about where is the United States land? Where is China land? You know, because those are, <laughs> they might become little, little island territories that, that are um, you know, under the influence of those countries. They also want to develop space tourism. And to this effect, they haven't developed any heavy lift vehicles, but they want to build a spaceport and they want to have people like companies like Virgin Galactic come and then launch people from those spaceports. So um, that, that's also a great idea. That is the model that we're using here in New Mexico with the Spaceport America. And we hope that Sir Richard Branson is going to be taking a rocket ride in his spaceship too in 2020, 2021, I mean. Um, anyway, um, they're also working on figuring out how to build self-sustaining habitats because they want to uh, basically build a self-sustaining habitat that on Earth, test it, and then, and then be able to transfer that technology and technology to say the moon or Mars. Um, I showed you this picture on the opening slide. Here's the first uh, Emirati uh, astronaut and uh, his name is Hazza El Mansouri, and he flew in 2017 to the International Space Station. Of course, he went on a Soyuz rocket. You can see here he is with his Russian crew. And uh, interestingly, you know, you want to ask how space changes people. Um, I loved, I read a little bit about this young man, and, um, you know, he was interviewed and said, well, what have you learned now that you've experienced space? And he said, be honest with yourself. And I thought that was pretty humble and pretty awesome. Here's an infographic of the uh, Emirates Mars mission. And uh, you can see here in this spot, this is the configuration of Earth. It's going around its orbit in this direction. And here's Mars and its orbit. Now, of course, please understand that on that scale, uh, everything is messed up about that scale. The relative distances, because Mars is really one and a half times further from um, uh, the sun than Earth is. And um, the other thing is that the planets obviously are made way too big. But the bottom line is, you know, it launched when Earth was over here in its orbit. And Earth then moved to here by the time it had arrived at Mars. And Mars was here when it launched, the mom. Okay. And, um, and then Mars was there when it went into orbit in February of 22. Okay. Uh, so here's a diagram showing this basic idea, and it's all broken down for you. I'm not going to go through the details. You can look at it and, and read it yourself if you want to take the time, but I just wanted to uh, show you where the Earth and Mars were in their orbits, mostly uh, to describe the MOM mission or the Emirates Mars mission. Okay, uh, moving right along now, we are going to talk about the uh, French program. This, um, the CNES, and it was established in about 1961. Their uh, budget is about $3 billion per year, and they actually contribute 27% of ESA's budget. So they are the largest uh, contributor to ESA of all the other European space agencies. I have a nice little diagram here that talks about the five main aspects of the French program. Uh, the first one is, um, they're the fifth ranked space program in the world. Uh, they have key applications that involve science, uh, lift vehicles and infrastructure, and then also earth sciences and uh, remote sensing. Then uh, their space budget is about 3.1 billion and they're growing about 5% every year and they spend about 1% of their gross domestic product. Now, I don't have that infographic for all the other uh, space agencies from all the other countries, but it's interesting to look at that kind of thing if you happen to be into it. Uh, I'm doing my best to try to not bore the heck out of you and more talk about the missions and things like that. Um, so I guess I'll jump over to here that uh, in these five areas, they have access to space, civilian applications of space, uh, sustainable development, 
uh, science and technology research, and then security and defense, of course. Um, so this is a, a bulleted list of some of the various things they've done. I'm not gonna go through them in great detail or in detail, but the point is that they are in collaboration with JAXA, ISRO, NASA, CNSA, and Roscosmos. So it's a very proactive and very interactive uh, space agency, really my biggest point there. And then from those collaborations, you can see they've, they're working on something like OceanSat, they've worked on uh, India's moon mission, they've engaged in something called the Copernicus program, which is a large uh, collaboration uh, in fact, they're one of the major um, motivators of this international collaboration to build a satellite to monitor the changes in the Earth's biosphere, which is something we desperately need uh, to chart. Um, they're involved in astronaut health and medicals through Russia. Um, they um, built a, a Bepi Colombo to monitor Mercury's magnetic field. That was a collaboration with JAXA, so that flew out to Mercury and orbited Mercury. Uh, and then they want to study the oceans, so they have the CFO sat or the Chinese France Oceanography Satellite that they did with China. And then they've made major contributions. Remember the Columbus module I talked about that the DXLR uh, had put it uh, on the space station? Uh, that's part of an ESA project. France was also a major contributor to that. Uh, also a major contributor to the automated transfer vehicle that I talked about. And then um, they have also uh, are working on something called the uh, InSight mission and that landed in uh, 2018. And they, they basically constructed the, the uh, main instruments that went on that. So there, there's a list that keeps going and keeps going, um, but those are just some highlights that I wanted to show you to give you a flavor of how they have their fingers in so many different pots and how uh, active and proactive they are. So they obviously are involved in the International Space Station. These are the French astronauts that uh, um, were transferred to the ESA Astronaut Corps in 2001. And then I wanted to show you this down here. You know, this is um, fantastic. This is uh, the instrumentation, the, the detector, if you will, the eyeballs um, of something called the Planck spacecraft. Now, this Planck spacecraft is designed to look at the echo of the Big Bang. It's called the cosmic background radiation. And this radiation is literally 13.6 uh, billion years old from the forming shortly after the Big Bang. And I just wanted you to look at this design of this because these are, the, these are called horns and these are designed to pick up these microwaves and focus them down and give you extreme spatial resolution uh, it, so that you, you know, when you look at it uh, in a two dimensional picture of what you're seeing, you not only have uh, very precise measurements of the intensity, but you have them uh, as on a 2D location like a very, very high resolution photograph showing you the hot and the cool spots from the early Big Bang. Uh, this revolutionized cosmology, um, as well as another spacecraft very similar to it, but when Planck flew, it really kind of knocked it down, uh, knocked the errors down and uncertainties down another notch. Um, it, it was operational from 2009 to 2013 and uh, is orbiting in that L2 spot that we talked about with the Chinese space program where uh, the Chang'e 2 had tested that orbit and then Chang'e 4 had put a remote uh, satellite, uh, relay satellite in orbit around the L2 uh, Lagrangian point behind the moon. Um, and then France is a big player in the Area 5 uh, heavy lift rocket. And so I wanted to talk about that briefly because that is a competitive workhorse against SpaceX uh, and NASA and the uh, United Launch uh, Alliance, these other places that, that uh, rent out, or I should say that you pay to, to launch your spacecraft or your satellite into space. Um, so basically they launched from two locations, one's in Southern France called the Toulouse Space Center. And the other one is uh, in the in Guana, French Guana uh, Space Center. And again, I cannot pronounce foreign languages, so you enjoy your laugh at my pronunciations. Uh, 
So this is down in the, in, in the southern region of South America and um, left over from the colonial imperialism land grab of parts of South America that weren't given back, or I should say, in a sense, given back, given back. Um, so here's the Ariane 5, uh, and here's a beautiful picture of us launching. And here it started in 1996, and you can see failure, partial failure, and, you know, as each year goes by. And then, wow, when they got to, you know, year 2000, they had four successful launches. Then they had a little bit of a rough start in the early 2000s, and then they really figured this rocket out, and it's been very, very successful. Um, unfortunately, it had a huge explosion in 2018, which uh, killed a, a, a cluster of satellites that was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, I don't know the exact figure, but uh, it was catastrophic. But other than that, they've had a tremendous success. So this is a competitive launch vehicle that everybody, when it was anything about space, should know that you know this Ariane 5 exists, that this ESA rocket that is actually uh, operationally run through uh, the, the CNES. Okay, let's talk about ESA very quickly. So now we're getting to the big, you know, the, the few last real big ones, okay. Um, $7.4 billion formed in around 1975, some 2000 employees. And as we've talked about the UK, Italy, Germany, and France now, uh, they provide 70% of the funding. The remaining 30% come from these other EU countries. Uh, and the map on the right, the green countries are those that are in ESA and also members of the European Union. Um, the blue uh, countries are not in ESA. They don't contribute to ESA, but they are members of the EU. And then of course, Norway and Switzerland are the two countries that are not in the EU, but are in ESA. So they, they, they contribute to the space program. Okay. Um, this little diagram here is just talking about, uh, gives the names of several astronauts and how many days they've spent in space that are ESA astronauts. And then some of the accumulative number of days uh, when you add up all the missions that that astronaut's been in. And I just wanted to show that in the, the little corner to show that they've really been active in, in crewed space flight. I, I just can't get used to saying crewed. Uh, this is from the ESA website, um, ESA.ENT, and um, this is a, a page called Our Missions, and I was really kind of impressed by this, so I took some screenshots and pasted them together in this mosaic of all of the different missions that are ongoing through ESA. As you can see, there's a large number of them, so there's a great deal of investment in the logistics of splitting up the budgets. You know, first of all, getting all the budgets from all the various countries together and then splitting the budgets up into all these projects uh, while you've got voting partners on, you know, that have different weight in their votes. So ESA is quite the organization, okay? It's very different than NASA in this regard uh, where, you know, it's just one country and one administration. This is a very large um, organization. Uh, in yellow are those which are launch and space vehicles. Um, so the Arian 5, the Vega, ex, et cetera, like that. And then the red are astronomy satellites, like the one I told you about the Planck satellite, whatnot, or instruments, so a lot of those other projects that we talked about. Um, and then on the uh, Earth sciences are in green. So you can see that a large part of their budget is going into Earth sciences, not just sort of, you know, the human space flight um, thing. And then uh, the red is uh, going into pure science. So there's a lot of science, a lot of earth science that's going into these space budgets. And so when people say, what are we learning and what do we get from space programs? Well, you know, uh, each one of these on their website is uh, clickable. And once you click on one of these things, it goes into a whole universe of all the things that they're doing, what the budgets are doing, what the plans are, what they've accomplished, how many people are employed, uh, how it's collaborating globally and internationally in the economy. It's, uh, it's really, you know, the space agencies, the space um, industry is really a, a powerful industry for the, for, the, for the world globally. Here is a 
the ESA astronauts that have um, been parts of various classes. And it turns out that they've only had two classes of astronauts. I think one that happened in 87 or something like that. And another one that happened in around 2000, 2001, or was it 2009? And so they're looking for more astronauts, but here are the astronauts. Um, this is when they uh, have uh, information about their missions. And the thing about this um, is that it comes down here and it has this question mark, you. And so, you know, the question is, I think in this little box is like, you know, do you have the right stuff? Do you want to be an astronaut? Whatever the right stuff is. And so I put together a slide here that uh, I wanted to share something about that because I know there when we talked to Andy and um, Andy Chaikin, that one of the questions was sort of about, you know, how to become an astronaut and, and these things like that. So guess what? ESA are looking for a new class of astronauts. So you want to be an astronaut? You basically have a window of about eight weeks to submit your application. They, they open on March 31st. So you'd better get to it, uh, considering that's tomorrow. This is, I'm giving this lecture on March 30th. Okay, so I'm putting together my application. No, I'm just kidding. Um, not a chance. Wait, wait till you see this uh, battery of things you've got to go through. And you have to get that in by my, May 28th. So right now, around the planet, people are scurrying to get their applications in to become an ESA astronaut. Well, I mean, what an exciting time that this is open because the last time was in 2009, you know, more than, you know, 10 years ago. Okay, so um, there's, it's a five, six step process, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight step process, excuse me. Um, first of all, you're gonna screen, okay? So basically you're gonna hand in all that paperwork, they're gonna go through all your paperwork, look at your, your application, they're gonna say, yes, you can move forward or no, you can't. Okay, so that's the first thing. You know, do you look good on paper? Phase two, they're gonna test you. Cognitive, technical, and motor coordination and personality. So, you know, um, that's, and that has to be high-end stuff. Test two, second phase, you know, psychometric testing, group and individual exercises, and practical testing. And so one of the things I have to say about this is, you know, if you didn't get along with your group in this class doing group projects, I don't think you're gonna make it as an ESA astronaut, okay? And one of the things I'd like to say is, you know, if you wanna elevate yourself in life, you've gotta not think about the other person and what they're doing. You have to be, you always have to be the adult in the room. You always have to be the one who's gonna say, I'm gonna bring these people together. And if these two people aren't getting along, I'm gonna do what I can to help that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm always gonna have the positive butterfly effect. And those are the type of people that become astronauts. They're always thinking about what am I doing and not blaming other people. And I say that because I've had a lot of trouble with the groups this semester. And so I'm just mentioning that sometimes we ought to not think about what the others did and think about how we can bring the others together. And I'm not saying it's easy, but that would be something that if you naturally were doing here in this class, in the group assignments, then I would say you're the type of person that is being sought, you know, for this kind of high level activity that's going on uh, at the very cutting edge of humanity. Why settle for less, I suppose, though I wish that I had the capabilities to pass these tests, even though I'd like to think I'm a positive person. I doubt I could pass these tests, really doubt it. Test three, uh, phase three, physical and mental abilities. Okay, so physical testing measured against international standards. Okay, so you're gonna be judged uh, very, very quantitatively here. Finally, if you pass all of those three phases of testing, then you go for some interviews. So you the panel interview and you are tested on technical behavioral comp competencies as well as you know, discuss various things. Um, this is where they'll vet out all of your qualifications and do 
background checks, interviewing people. You know, oh, I knew him when he was five years old. I knew her when she was in high school, you know, things like that. Um, and then interview round two, if you pass one, it's the final stage. You, you really go in and talk to the high level ESA people, uh, the, what they're calling the director general, and then a final decision will be made. And this final decision should happen in mid to late 2022. So in the summer of 2022 or the fall of 2022, be watching for an announcement of this select group of people that uh, made it through this battery of tests. Um, if you want to know more about it, there is a booklet online and here is a link to it. Uh, I think it's really quite interesting to look at. It has a lot of infographics in it. It's not highly technical. It actually has a lot of um, information put together in little diagrams like this. So it's, it's, uh, it's nice to look at and you get a really good feeling without having to do a deep dive. You know, there's no too long, didn't read situation. They, they were really smart about how they put this together. Okay, so ESA's human and robotic exploration. Again, something I don't wanna do a deep dive on, but um, ESA is definitely planning on partaking in the, uh, what's going on in the moon and getting involved with the gateway, okay? But apparently they're interested in cis uh, lunar vehicles. And uh, then with Mars, they're also interested in having a, a Mars rover, doing a sample return and doing orbiting. And then of course, returning from orbit because you'd have to have the uh, sample brought back up to the satellite. And then very much like what the Chinese did, then you have to do a trans-Earth injection and get home uh, with your sample. So this is a very fantastic uh, set of ideas that they're playing with. And then this is why they want this next class of astronauts. What I don't know is how many new astronauts they want. Okay, rounding it out, coming to the end of the show here is NASA. And we're going to spend in time in module three, really more talking about some of NASA's plans, like the, the uh, return to the moon and the Artemis project. So Artemis being the sister of Apollo. Um, and um, this whole program on an Orion spacecraft that's being flown up with the space launch system. So here's the space launch system rocket. Um, here's the, uh, the ground operations, the uh, infrastructure required to operate and uh, implement the space launch system. The spacecraft Orion is another part of this entire uh, uh, exploration. Um, and then uh, and operations. And then there's the gateway, which is going to orbit the moon, which is for docking and uh, lunar orbit rendezvous. And then you have a series of lunar landers that would go back and forth between the gateway and would never go back across this lunar space. It would all stay at the moon. And in fact, you can see behind me is something uh, in my um, background is one of the uh, artist rendition of one of these lunar landers. And then of course you have this Artemis uh, generation spacesuits uh, for walking on the moon. So all of this stuff is being developed as we speak. Um, and then here's the entire NASA budget. And I just wanted to say that uh, the 22.6 billion is for space operations and exploration. It's basically this half of the pie here. And just to show you that NASA is involved in a lot of other things, including, of course, uh, bureau bureaucratic uh, money, which is 15%, uh, construction and, and infrastructure, uh, and then uh, inspector general and things like that, you know, uh, the bureaucracy of, of uh, the United States. Uh, and then here is all the money that goes into science projects. So like when I proposed to NASA to do some science to study galaxies and there's a call for proposals and I submit it, say, hey, I'd like to study galaxies. Can you give me a couple hundred thousand dollars out of this piece of pie? Uh, once in a while I get lucky and they send me some money to do my research, support grad students and things like that. And then we have uh, aeronautical research because after a while you, 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 you do remember that there's this word in, this, in NASA called aeronautical. Okay, so it's kind of shrunk down from the space word, uh, but um, this is the space, the purple, and then this is the this orange here, or this red is the aeronautical at uh, around 3%. And then sort of space technologies 
uh, and developing those. So here's another picture of the uh, space launch system. This is a rocket that we'll be talking about more in the future. Um, it's supposed to be a little bit more powerful than the um, Apollo uh, Saturn V. Um, here it is next to a Falcon uh, uh, Heavy. And so you can see the relative size of this. Um, and it won't be until the uh, SpaceX Starship is, is uh, operational that a more powerful rocket will exist than the Space Launch System. Okay, so I got just a few more graphs. So I'd like to tell you that the um, spacecraft payload is the Orion spacecraft. I better write that down for myself. Okay, now, um, so who's been to the moon? Let's talk about that real quickly. And then we have one more infographic for who's been to Mars, okay? So these are the countries that have been to the moon, and this is basically how many times they've been to the moon. Um, when I pulled this infographic up, it was as of July, 2019. So I added Israel uh, to that, okay? So uh, India has orbited the moon with their um, Cherianin, I can't pronounce, uh, remember how you say it. On, um, Chandra, Chandrayaan uh, one orbited, and then Chandrayaan, I think I got those names right, two that had the crash lander. Um, and uh, so who else has been to the moon? Uh, Luxembourg has been to the moon, uh, the European Union, that's ESA, and then Japan twice, uh, China seven times, and we've gone through those missions, Russia 23 times, and the United States 30 times. And these are not broken down by um, uh, crewed missions or um, orbiting missions and landing missions, but this is the total number of times if land or orbited, some with people. Uh, and I added Israel uh, for their Bereshit uh, program, um, and hopefully this will be Bereshit too, and it will be a success. So I, I added them to this infographic. Who's been to Mars? Okay. Uh, so at least we're going to color these by successful, uh, basically ongoing, and then unsuccessful. A total of about 50 missions have gone to Mars. Uh, the United States is up here with 32, and you can see a fairly uh, even distributions of success and failure. You know, uh, Russia has had many, many more failures than they've had successes. Uh, they have none that are currently ongoing. Um, actually, I should have made this as a yellow. Um, down here, because I added the UAE. So uh, European Union, three, one, they're, they're shooting 30% here, 33%. Um, and then here's sort of a European Russian, uh, and those two are ongoing. So as far as the Soviets go, or the Roscosmos solo, uh, it's more of the collaboration between ESA and Russia. And then Japan, they uh, made an attempt, and China, uh, made an attempt, and then India uh, has an ongoing mission, and the UAE has an ongoing mission. So Mars is pretty active. Uh, I didn't put anything about Venus, but the Soviet Union has done soft landing on Venus and, and the Earth. Um, sorry, the uh, United States has had missions, uh, orbiters and landers as well, and probes. Um, I just wanted to show you what people think in the United States about putting people in space. And so uh, if you order this from, you know, the largest percentage that thinks it's a top priority downward to the lowest percentage that thinks it's a top priority, let's look at what's on the top. Monitoring Earth climate systems, monitoring asteroids that could strike the Earth. Let's look what's on the bottom. Sending astronauts to Mars sending astronauts to the moon, sending civilians into space to Mars and moon. Okay, so really uh, the, large, a large, the largest populations when it comes to putting people in space, uh, the largest populations are the sort of not too important or a priority. You see 39 to 42% uh, think that that's not much of a priority. And in fact, uh, even 36% think 
that um, new life, uh, looking for life on in habitable planets or on habitable moons in the solar system is also sort of not too important. Okay. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, what's kind of bothersome to me is that there's this sort of steady background 12 to 13 uh, percent don't know, don't have any opinion. And um, I, I, you know, I have to wonder why people don't have an opinion, but um, I wish that people did. I wish that we could reach those people. Um, also, I wonder if there's anything on this list for myself or for you, you know, I, I ask you where, where would you answer each of these questions, which color or which category would you put yourself for each of these topics? Um, and I often wonder about the red as well, sort of the should not be done. And this is the interesting thing is that the largest percentages there also are not finding life, putting people on the moon, putting people on Mars, or just even civilians, not just astronauts. So this is kind of an interesting thing that this kind of space survey would come up with these answers. When, when you look back and understand the history of humanity through the sea race, through the discoveries of the sea race and how that's changed. Can you imagine if we'd never gone out in those ships? I mean, the world would be extremely different, but would we even have developed flight? Would we have you know, the shipping that got developed and then flight that got developed after the shipping and then space flight? Would all of those things happen if, if we didn't have the drive to go forth ourselves? And so we filled the planet. Let's face it, we have filled the planet. What, what's left is to go down into the oceans or to go out into space. Okay, so I, I, I'm curious about there being one fourth roughly of all people saying people shouldn't go to the moon or Mars. I wonder, I hope that will change. Okay, second to last slide, bear with me. Um, this is very important slide here, uh, in my opinion, on the right-hand side. The left-hand side is just sort of a, an infographic on what countries uh, have the most satellites in space. Of course, it's the, the usual suspects, as they say in Casablanca, United States, China. Um, and then if you add up all the other nations, they actually, all the other nations that are multinational uh, conglomerations together, beat out sort of Roscosmos, Russia, followed by the United Kingdom. Remember we talked about how they were big on satellites uh, as they were developing their space program. And you have JAXA and then India and Canada. Okay, and it's interesting the mixed uses here between the military, uh, commercial, uh, civilian, various uses, and then governmental uses, which who knows what that's for. Um, so. Some of this is, I don't know which category, for example, GPS follows, falls into. Okay. Uh, what has to happen for people to go out of space for all of these things that these space programs wanna do? They have to bring the cost of putting a payload in space. Um, they need to bring it down. And when you go back to the space shuttle era here in $2,020, uh, that was costing about $85,000 a kilogram. Um, the, the space launch system is right now supposed to be coming in around $135,000 a kilogram. So when I told you that it wasn't really an effective uh, launch system, um, that tells you right there that it's actually less efficient at kilogram to LEO uh, launching than the space shuttle was. And the space shuttle turned out to be a, an economic disaster uh, for itself at some level. Um, they brought that space shuttle down uh, by the time they got to the mid 90s, uh, down to about $26,000 a kilogram. Uh, the Falcon 1, uh, SpaceX, uh, brought it down below 10,000. And that was a very, very important mark. And then the Atlas V is bringing it down to about five to 6,000. The Falcon 9, had brought it all the way down to less than 2,000. So we're really starting to see a decrease on this slope. The Falcon Heavy has brought it down to less than $1,000 a kilogram. So really we're talking about 
um, from about 100,000 down to about 1,000. So we're down to about 1% of what it was costing back in the 70s, okay? And that's tremendous. That's a, you know, that's the reusability. That's Elon Musk and his reusable rockets. Um, the space launch system hasn't launched yet, but here it is in the early 2020s, and it's going to be a, a spike that just sticks out like a sore thumb. So you can see now how ineffective it is from this graphic. If this curve continues on its way down, somewhere in 2040, we might be down to about $10 a kilogram and say by the 2060s, 2070s down, well, if we can build something called a space elevator, which we'll talk about in module three, then we could basically get down to about a dollar a kilogram to space. And so at that point, I can go up to space for, you know, I don't know, uh, $90, $100, okay. That's, how does that work? I go to space for $100. Heck, it costs more than that to fly to New York. Okay, uh, so this is a big push, and reusable rocketry is going to be a big part of pushing this down. And um, this is our key. If we can continue to move this curve, then, you know, as we saw the aviation industry become completely affordable and go from, you know, a 120 second flight on a beach uh, to then by the 1950s, commercial airlines, and then in the 70s and 80s, global airlines uh, all over the place, and the cost of the seat going down to affordable levels, because in the 50s, you know, it was like the equivalent of $10,000 today to get an airplane flight. So now uh, we're talking about the fact that we, in the, in the late 2000s here, before 2100, Space flight could become very affordable. And then, you know, if someone builds a hotel in space, it doesn't cost you that much to get up there. It just requires bravery. And I'm going to end with this slide, which I'm not going to discuss. This is the basically a infographic on space launches that have happened that are military in red, commercial in gray, government in blue, and what we would call amateur in. Um, orange. And uh, we have the, the Russia on this side, and we have the United States on this side, and then we have all other countries here. So you can sort of just sort of look around at this infographic, and you can see here's China really growing. The problem with this infographic is that it stops in 2011, and that's really when China started kicking on. Remember, they didn't put their first man in space until 2013. Um, so uh, when we get into module three, we're going to try, you know, fill in this gap about what's been happening in these various countries, but particularly going into the commercial launches during this period of time. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for sticking out for this lecture for all of you who are left and didn't bell after I gave what the what's in the payload. Um, I know this was a bit of a long lecture. But um, I really think that it's a, a cutting edge piece of information for most people to learn about what's been going on with these different countries. So next time I see you, we'll be entering into module three and um, we'll be talking about the future of space rather than what's happened in space. Okay, um, I hope you've enjoyed it and um, we'll see you next time.